uh, other folks will be able to catch up, right? Um, hello, everybody. As I mentioned the uh, previous class, um, today's class will just touch high level, just an introduction on basically the class topic. What is governance risk management and compliance that it relates to um, cybersecurity as well as, um, you know, recent times in terms of like modernization cloud and things like that. And then also um, for this class, you do not need the book. Actually, the book entirely, it's more of a recommendation. So it's optional. There are no um, task act activities, exam quizzes, or anything um, based on the lectures. That will just be a discussion among us and me just lecturing more of like an asynchronous thing, I guess I will say for the first four classes. <laughs> this is um, the part where I usually see a lot of you that have a lot of experience in um, governance risk and compliance as well as the executives in the class some of you that even have more experience than myself tend to find this section boring because you just hear of things that you already know so um i urge you to please be patient with us because there are folks who are new there are others who actually do not have work experience as well as some are actually just getting into the field, right? So that high level knowledge, as basic as it might sound to others, it's often lays the foundation for others to know the starting point of their journey within the field. So just bear with us. Um, with regard to the book, so <laughs> I have the new version, this is it. Uh, that's the seventh edition. And I believe it came out this August or July. I'm not sure. And this is the old one, the sixth edition. I don't know. It seems a bit blurry because it's not a it's not a fish. I guess Zoom's facial recognition thing is it's working. Well, sorry. I'll attach the picture to you guys later. But um I assume the content should be closely related. But I'm also, as I keep saying, honestly, I know the books are quite expensive, so it's up to you. Whatever um, you decide, having the book will not necessarily allow you to say pass an exam in the class because there's no there's no exams, right? But then also, I don't foresee not having it as impacting you in the class significantly or anything. However, if you want to expand your knowledge, it's definitely a good starting point. Okay. Um, let me begin. So today we will kind of go over at a very high level, right? What basically is information security? Now we're not deep diving into the technical aspect of things. We are not talking about cybersecurity or network security, cloud security, or any of those uh, in depth, just at a very high level. So many terminologies are often thrown around around cloud security, computer security, network security, information security. How are all of those related? What is what? And um, I mean, just a very simple generic definition, right? And then we'll touch on governance, risk management, and compliance. Now, I know the class is more, the title of the class is actually cybersecurity risk management. And I've been um, thinking of updating the even name of the class to include the governance and um, the compliance side of things because truly risk management is just one aspect of grc uh the field as well or rather we'll see risk management has evolved to include governance so plugging in executives as well as the compliance side of things right uh especially within um it side of things we will talk about organizational roles now bear with me I know you're not doing a master's in management, a lot of you. Um, Mr. Master's in cybersecurity, you will be like, why is he talking about organizational roles? Just bear with me a little bit. Um, the first part of the class, you will see there are a little bit of it that relates to more MBA, executive perspective, senior management, man uh, again, management side of things, all of those. It's truly because the entire IT field, um, cybersecurity, information security has evolved to a point where it should be executive driven. Cybersecurity or even IT is no longer a tech shop within an organization. Uh, it's really something that have a seat in the board, uh, on the board. 
side of things. Um, there is a dedicated seat for, we do have cybersecurity executives like the CISO within um, the senior management and all of those and understanding how they see things and learning to drive from an executive perspective tends to have this ripple down effect that ultimately affects the way technology is um, affected. As well as risk management, it's not only technology, or rather, let me say, cybersecurity is not just technology, it's also compliance with the law, compliance with the existing regulations. Um, it, it is just so broad, right? So there's a playground for everybody in the field. So as such, we will just touch on those at a very high level. Hence why you're seeing organizational roles. I promise you, Marimon did not have you um, here doing a PhD in cybersecurity. Oh, sorry, Marimon is not trying to sell PhD in management as PhD in cybersecurity. No, you are doing a PhD in cyber. Um, we will talk at a very high level just introduce some existing frameworks, regulations, standards. Uh, a lot of you know some of the existing laws. Um, I mean, let's talk HIPAA. If you talk about HIPAA today, everybody knows there's a law that is in place. But as we begin to drill down and get in detail of how do you also satisfy HIPAA requirements, right? How do you satisfy that and whatever from the tech side of things, then you begin to see there are nuances of cybersecurity. Oh, you have a patient's record, then it needs to be stuck and uh, secured. Well, how do you achieve that? Maybe you encrypt it. So then now you begin to see the technology, but it's all driven by the law, by the regulations, the frameworks and all of those, or rather I will say the frameworks help one towards um, implementations, right? So we'll talk, introduce some of them at a very high level. And then um, we'll talk about a life cycle of like risk management only without the governance or the compliance. And one of the rationale of deciding to go with ISACA in this class is truly, I'm not an ISACA agent, <laughs> but it's just the way we structured the class since start, the start, it's there is this side of the industry. So private organizations, uh, private entities and all of that. And then we have the government, uh, by government, I meant not governance, but like true government, like US Gov, uh, nation states and whatever. And you find approach to governance risk and compliance can differ a little bit. There are some nuances uh, in how they are not necessarily handle it, but what drives it. Uh, you take a place like the, I would say financial sector, or maybe the private sector, which is heavily profit driven, probably, you will find how they handle governance, risk management and compliance. It's all about making sure it and ultimately it doesn't hinder making profit. Um, you pick a place like say US Gov, right? Or let's even take one of the national security agencies or things like that. You find it's not profit driven, but there is a different mission and whatever, the GRC's like risk management approach is being taken, there has to be an alignment to ensure that it doesn't hinder achieving that mission. So ISACA has built this name and a niche for themselves around enterprise on a global scale from, especially from a public uh, side of things where they kind of are among the big players in terms of defining risk management uh, as well as that um, governance side of things. So that's one of the reasons why we are going with ISACA to focus more on the private um, entities and also public. Now on the government side of things, we will introduce things like NIST at the later side of the class, but more from the implementation side of things. Um, great, uh, I agree with you, Vito. Uh, it's a great certification, I've heard a lot about it, okay. Next. So this is basically a dictionary definition, but everybody understand the state, uh, the definition of security, right? Free from danger and whatever. Sure, we all understand what information is. Data, uh, we also understand what data is. We have an understanding of definition and things like that of information. So I don't need to read that. But when you start to see information security, especially from a 
perspective of cybersecurity, then we tend to have these things like the CIA triads, which I believe a lot of you have, under, have an understanding of the CIA triads, like the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And you also introduce non-repudiation, which should be on its own, but you know, depends on uh, who you're talking to. Some see non-repudiation as part of integrity, some see it as a separate thing. But there's this idea of a CIA triad that kind of drives the entire information security, right? Where everything, like it becomes the pillar for information security, especially on the risk management side of things. So if you have a data, it's either uh, there is a huge uh, importance on confidentiality or the integrity of the data is much more important or the availability or even the combination of all. But that, those are kind of um, the approach that are usually taken. Last class, I gave an example of like a data or maybe a system that has been configured within say a library, a public library. Let's use Library of Congress as an example. If you have a computer within the Library of Congress and it's under attack or whatsoever, probably the Library of Congress might configure their device prioritizing availability because at the end of the day, those documents, data and whatever that are within there, uh, including like the books and all of those, um, basically the library content are most beneficial from an availability standpoint, right? Especially if it's like a public library. So if the computer is getting hacked or maybe some form of a ransomware or whatever it is, the best and ideal situation will be like for the data to be available, right? Um, that's from a library standpoint. If you look at it from that CIE triad, you will find like availability is definitely much more important. So it's more higher and things like that. If we had to now switch the um, side of things to maybe say national security, actually let's borrow from the name CIE triad, let's see the CIE, right? Um, data within those organizations like national security organizations, you might find there are certain data than for them to see the light, they rather get completely burned, right? Um, it depends on what kind of information it is, but if it's going to definitely impact national security, then they rather lose the data than make it actually available. So devices will be configured in such a way that they prioritize confidentiality and availability becomes very low. Or maybe if you're talking about a, a hospital, a health place, some health related, uh, Please, then they will prioritize integrity above everything because they are maybe an authoritative body providing information. So they need to make sure that everybody that is consuming such information um, basically has the most accurate uh, information, right? I mean, another one could be the whoever is reporting the weather, right? If there is a governing body or an institution that their primary job is to report the weather, then integrity is absolutely um, important to them. So um, please don't forget if you have any questions, uh, feel free to um, add it to the chat and we'll address it. So that whole kind of CIE triad, I believe a lot of you um, have seen this, but it tends to revolve around data and services, even from my example that I gave you. Data was the fulcrum of the example, right? The library, national security, and all of those. But what is data? We're talking about information, right? That has been stored maybe in some form of machine. But then there's this whole concept of seeing, so earlier we mentioned security as a state of being secure, or maybe, you know, there's just this viewpoint of security as some form of protection. Can we change the mindset, right? And this is where it can be a bit challenging, especially entirely within the, um, especially within the entire cybersecurity sector. You find that there is this notion of cybersecurity is all about protection. Not really. Ensuring business processes run in itself is actually a form of cybersecurity. And uh, what do I mean by that? You can configure a device so secure to a point that is no longer operational and now it impacts the entire organization's ability to achieve its objectives. That's not cybersecurity. That's just something else. I don't, I don't know what that is. Actually, the inverse side of that, ensuring that 
no one has the ability or like ensuring that there are controls in place that do not allow you to configure a device such that it's no longer functional is cybersecurity. What do I mean by that? Let me use an iPhone, for example. I don't know if they still do that, but like back in the days, I remember with like iPods, uh, some early generation of iPods, you can keep trying the password and it will say it will all lock after five minutes and then maybe you can even keep doing it and then you see something like a hundred years. I can tell you, configuring that and mistakenly getting it to such a way that now the device is completely bricked and it won't get unlocked so after a hundred years that is not a good approach to cyber security however ensuring that no one can actually put the device to a point where it's not going to be unlocked so after 100 years that is cyber security so then you begin to see that cyber security can be an enabler within a business rather than just this restrictive org or restrictive kind of thing right and it's all about mindset of how we chose to see it and um, for such a long time the community often especially within organizations is like the other arm of legal department whenever you hear about them or hr then you know just keep a heartbeat so most times you hear things from the server you just know like ah oh, this is that security admin that is trying to put to multi factor authenticator on my laptop now i put my password now i have to do this again so like there's always that side of seeing them as just entities that are either blockers or restrictive it doesn't have to be that right so um what ensures that the mindset and the way we see that changes is all up from the governance side and what do i mean by the governance that's from the organizational culture you look at um how are senior management driving it and all of that? So we'll touch a little bit on that governance as well, right? But we have the governance side of things around the management and all of that policy, and then eventually you start getting into processes and whatever, and then you start thinking of CIA is triads, right? So this is just a high level of true. I think it's a PhD class, you will definitely uh, do things on your own. Without reading from the slide, I'm just kind of putting them side by side to look at what exactly is, as we talk about GRCs, GRCs, and now it's like a hot term within um, the entire field, right? Right, as executives are continuously getting to understand the value of cybersecurity. So continuously, GRC is just the new, the new thing. Before it used to just be risk management, now GRC. So, what exactly is governance? And ignore cybersecurity and just think of governance in itself, right? Earlier I was talking about seeing security from that protection side of things where it's more of a blocker and restrictive. And I was talking about, no, it can be an enabler. When you look at governance, we all know it has to do with accountability. And this is that difference in definition between accountability and responsibility. We will also talk about that in a bit later. But truly, it's ensuring certain accountability, right, related to whatever the organization's objective, assets, and all of those fancy words are. But basically, the main purpose of the organization, right, having some form of accountability. But for such a long time, governance has been seen governance in relation to cyber as well as cyber security uh, in relation to cyber security uh, and also with like risk management has been seen as this protection as i was saying earlier so where senior management are actually putting policies out that doesn't allow entities or employees to do certain things so if you work for a big organization that has this kind of so many protections so you have to deploy a vpn or an endpoint or whatever it is um before you're able to access services you cannot copy you cannot all of those kind of restrictive mechanisms and there are existing documented policies with severe penalties when you take those actions so then from a human perspective i promise you i'm not teaching psychology but you begin to see it more as these entities are, these organizations are putting blockers and 
not allowing you to do certain things. But what if we flip the switch? What if we begin to see it more as the organizations are actually doing that to create value for the organization? I'm not saying for the entity, but for the organization itself. What are the chances of an organization allowing everything open and having a rogue entity copy their most proprietary stuff, their cash cow elsewhere and giving it to a competitor? Now, I mean, they might win the battle, but it's still out there. Imagine being Coca-Cola, literally. If the recipe is on a computer, you know, and there are no controls and mechanisms. Literally, you could copy it probably and pass it on to Pepsi. So just put it out there. I don't know. I don't even drink soda, but I also don't know how it's going to taste. But um, the typical Coca-Cola employee, and by typical, I mean someone who is not at the executive level that will understand the rationalization behind how things, why things are done, I see it as Coke is really just trying to put so much, you know, stuff along the way that doesn't allow them to function. And if you can see it as bureaucrats, could be, but rather than seeing it as protection, it truly, truly, we can refine the definition to be more of accountability around adding value to the organization's mission, right? If that recipe is out, probably everybody at Coca Cola might. You know, if they don't lose their job, the sales might still drop and they might lose a significant bonus. Now it's directly impacting them. And um, how do we ensure governance? How does leadership, those folks at the round table, and some of you are here, let me actually take a look at the screen. Most of them, the ones that are wearing suits, I'm pointing you guys. Anybody that is wearing a suit is an executive. I'm wearing a t shirt, but anyway. Um, how do um, these senior management and executives um, really govern, right? From an organizational perspective. Now, I'm not talking about an Asian state. I'm talking about just organizations. How do they govern, right? It's really by ensuring every single thing aligns with the business objectives or business goals, business missions, business whatever, right? And in this case, or rather, I'm talking about objective mission goals. I'm just putting them all at in a single bucket and focusing on what the organization is trying to achieve. Um, if it's for profit, no matter what it is, the organization is focused on maybe making profit. If it is a nonprofit, there has to be something they're trying to achieve. If you look at a nation state, ultimately, ultimately, a nation, let's use the US, everybody might have their own definition of what the US is trying to achieve as a single entity, but from a governance perspective, you, that's why during campaign, these politicians will keep mentioning what they are trying to achieve, right? Um, if you bring it down to agencies level, national security, the thing is protect the homeland. Um, health agencies probably ensure health and safety of folks within the nation. So all of these are around the business objectives. Every single decision that happens at the governance level, and I'm not saying it, it does happen, I'm saying ideally every single decision that happens relating to cybersecurity governance should be to align with the overall objectives of the organization. But there are other things. Within an organization, you could have some I don't know, you call them sub-organizations, sub-departments or whatsoever. It does have to start with those alignment. If you are in the tech shop and the tech shop, I keep saying tech shop, but like if you're in the IT department, the IT department's first objective probably is to ensure everybody's devices is up and running, all those softwares, everything that the organization needs to move forward and zero, Oh, zero downtime, good luck with that. But anyway, um, you know, everything is just functioning as a CS admin. If that's the top priority, then whatever approach or decision is being made should first align with that. Then you now see how that complements with the overall organization's objective. Now, if you cannot find that alignment between your sub organization's objectives with the overall objective, then probably you're off track, right? And the more we do that, the more we begin to see why, you know, 
I used to be a tech guy, uh, a full blown engineer, right? And I always wonder, like, why are these folks who have zero technical skill set just being the ones dictating and deciding what we are going to do? Like, seriously, do you even know what we need to do? And they do. They probably don't have the skill set to do the implementation, but it doesn't mean they are incapable of making a decision or governing or deciding what should go forward and how we should operate. It's the same reason why someone with an MBA will go be the um, see, I wouldn't say CMD, but will be the overall person heading a hospital and not the chief surgeon, you know? Probably the chief surgeon is always hyper-focused on their primary job where being the best surgeon, but the hospital's objective is probably to make profit. So not talking about morals here, but you know, depends. Whatever your view are, that's how they tend to see things, right? So some key questions that I usually ask on those stages, you find like, are we doing the right things? Are we doing them the right way? And right is very subjective. I'm talking about right by the organization, right? And are we doing them well? And are we getting the benefit? Benefit is also subjective. It depends on what the objectives of the organizations are and ensuring that those benefits are related or aligned. That's how we see cybersecurity from a governance perspective. And we do have tools that allow you to track those. Risk management side of things. So we've talked about governance. We talk about all of those. Normally out of governance, you begin to see the output of a governance should include some form of a law, include a policy, or include something that is binding. Um, technically, I would say, something that if it is not followed might actually have some consequences, right? Um, or if it's violated might have some consequences. And that's why at the organization level, we do have policies. And that's why you also see, I think like bring your own device policy. You don't see bring your own device risk management. Um, so how do we ensure that those policies are implementable, are implemented as well. And also they're aligned to whatever we're doing for the implementation is aligned to that policy or the law, basically aligned to the governance. That's risk management. Why do we then say it's risk? So I will trace back a little bit. As an organization, the organization decides that you know what, we're not going to allow anybody to connect their personal device to our network because once they do, there could be a chance that they will be able to get into our servers and get our records. So as such, no personal devices. Okay, that's a governance decision. Senior management decide, decided that because they feel like that action or that approach is the best that is, uh, will be the best for the organization. They, they will not just stop there. What will be the output? They'll write a policy that applies to every single employee. You can come in with your personal device, set up your own hotspot or whatever, fine, but do not connect to the network. Again, someone in the IT shop will just say, well, you don't even need to tell them not to connect to the network. You can just configure it. But here's the thing, you in the IT shop, how do you make sure Actually, first, how do you even go about implementing if the policy that tells you to implement doesn't exist, right? Or that is a principal guide doesn't exist. Now we have the policy, but the policy in itself doesn't take the action, nor does it provide a framework on how we should take the action. It also doesn't provide what should be the consequences and all of that. So it also probably highlights the risk of connecting devices within the policy. Maybe the policy documentation might say something like, yeah, if you connect to this, there are chances of, you know, stealing our records or it makes our network vulnerable and all of that because we don't know the vulnerabilities in your system. So I search it's not allowed. Great, so it has identified the risk. You have responded to the risk. But how do you even first identify the risk? make a decision on this is the best approach to respond to that, monitor it, 
and all of that. So a combination of all of those is what we call the risk management side of things, has to be driven by governance. And uh, we will deep dive a lot into risk management and even the hands-on we will do in the class later on. It will be very technical, but it will be done with risk in mind. And I will give an example. I hope I'm not confusing people. I'm just jumping all over the place. Um, maybe we will have like an activity, a hands-on activity that says, that shows how you just encrypt a VM, right? We deploy a virtual machine, um, or maybe set up some Kubernetes environment or anything like that, like some containers or whatever, and do some security task related to it. Or we might even deploy like a um, multi-factor authenticator, but that is not enough. And later on in the class, I will discuss that. The goal is not to focus on how to do the technical implementation, our hands-on in the class. It will be more of why are we doing it? And the why is also not enough it will have to also look at what are the benefits of doing so. Then you begin to see, okay, if I am forced to discuss the benefits, not just the rationale of, not just the why of technical implementation, but also the benefits, um, you will begin to see the IT department in itself will begin saying, maybe we shouldn't do it. All right. And then um, we have the compliance side of things. The compliance is just ensuring that we are adhering to whatever the output of the governance is, following whatever the uh, risk management says. Wait, did I just see a thumbs up somewhere? Yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, I'm seeing it here. This was, it's a bit distracting. But anyway. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, compliance had to do with making sure we follow the governance output for, uh, based on what is laid out during the risk management. So what does that mean? Let me take a step back. HIPAA, from a health perspective, the health standpoint, the US Gov, that's governance side, decides that will be a law or an act it's going to be called HIPAA and it's applicable to the entire health, in, well, health industries that manage patient records, right? It's applicable to it, great. But it doesn't say how they should comply with it, how they should assess risk, how they should manage the risk or any of those. Rather, it just says, make sure the health uh, patient records are secured and all of that. It doesn't even set the requirements, right? Risk management will do that. Risk management will then focus on creating a framework, a standard, what is considered the minimum requirements, the baseline of ensuring that we are in compliance, like any organization is in compliance with HIPAA. Right. Now, ensuring that we are continuously in compliance with HIPAA is the compliance side of things. So, could be those entities that will come in the auditors to check. Uh, from the US Gov side, there is like this department GAO. Um, they are like the audit office that basically go around and check if everybody is complying with what they're supposed to comply. Uh, from the industry, it depends on what you're looking at. Uh, financial industry, I believe there are entities that check compliance related to SOC. Um, I mean, stock market, we have the SEC. Uh, PCI DSS, I believe there are, there are also entities that ensure compliance. So all of those are entities that ensure compliance and the framework that exists is part of what outlines how to do risk management. Um, any question here? Feel free to go off mic or any points to add. Please, anybody that does this on a day to day, add pointers on how do you handle either governance, risk management or compliance in your organization, please go for it. Nobody that I call names. Oh, it's not high school. All right. Um, so. Hello? 
Yeah, go for it. Yes, Steve? So um, a point that I wanted to make is that often what we see is there's conflicts, there's conflict between the governance and what we're and how we want to manage the risk, because I've seen that be two different entities. So when the governance comes down and says, OK, here are the things that we need to do. And then there is another committee that talks about then how we're going to manage those risks with either identifying them, monitoring them or continuous monitoring which is usually what we do. Um, I find that sometimes there's conflict in how we run those things to ground and what we call compliance. So being as discreet as possible, I find to be very helpful in, in when we're look, talking about the GRC. That's fair. I, I agree. And I think it all starts with governance. I don't have an answer to that, nor am I a policy person or a political scientist, but you tend to find like governance is usually driven from a lot learning from experience. So something has happened or we have seen it or we understand the consequences and hardly do we really think forward. We are constantly just responding. Then we will have a law in place, especially these days around the cyber field, right? One technology is going at a much faster rate. Cyber is constantly catching up, including the laws. Um, and then you need to have the governance side of things before we even have the risk management. So then you begin to see we have governance or policies or laws have been passed that requires a tweak or a quick update or even a new framework or risk management approach, but we are not there yet. We do need to comply with the law, but we don't have a process of complying with the law. Let me give you an example of a case I read. It's around uh, forensics, right? The forensics field is actually, I don't know if they have caught up, but at some point they were, there was this huge gap of a child pornography, for example. Not only is it illegal, but trace of it in your system in itself, it's a lot, right? You can get indicted because of that. But then cases started getting thrown out because you're only supposed to focus on those, like let's say if it's image, you're only supposed to focus on image within a, if you um, see someone's computer. So any mistake, maybe you go play a music within the computer or you look at something that you're not supposed to, then you find there are now loopholes within it that might eventually get a case thrown. So then we now have the governance covered on the law side, but we like the framework and processes that will allow the risk management. And because of that, how do you even ensure compliance? Because now we don't like, Ensuring compliance in itself is going to be difficult without an, I will say, a mature um, risk management approach. So I agree 100% with you. It's constantly challenging. We are constantly trying to catch up with it. But yeah, similar thing happened with deep fakes recently. Anybody want to chime in as well? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was. I hope I'm not stepping on those toes. I, I had a quick question, Justin, as it relates to cloud technologies, because we're seeing that's where a lot of change is taking place, especially with the talk of different ways to do containerization and where does the data, who owns the data, where, and, and so forth. Are you seeing changes um, on how we're approaching the governance within cloud tech? Uh, not necessarily the governance, but there has been a lot of processes um, getting updated and approach. Uh, so my most of my experience are on the Gov side and mm -hmm. uh, I'm also in cloud security and I'll give you a couple of examples. When you look at uh, DOD that used to focus primarily on DIACAP, which is absolutely on-prem, uh, have nothing to do with um, cloud. Cloud does not even exist when the concept of cloud as an external provider, because cloud has already been here, right? Terminals are cloud technically, but from an external provider where it's a shared responsibility did not exist at some point. Um, and um, all of the processes, so frameworks approach, because DICAP is a framework and all the other ones are basically focused to be on-prem. Now we got to a place where we do have cloud, we have external providers, and we have the governance out, like you take something like DISA SRG, which is a doc document that provides more uh, approach on the governance side. It also 
comes all the way down from FISMA, but then there are no frameworks within even DOD. So DOD is not leveraging like FedRAM, but then also you begin to see, well, FedRAM is designed for public entities uh, and heavily CSPs that are federal civilian entities, not necessarily national security. So then you begin to see some nuances, right? That differs. Uh, for some of you here that are within DOD, you find like FedRAM doesn't do CCI mappings, but DOD does that. So how do you then bridge that? Um, so yeah, we are seeing it, but on the CSP side of things as well, it's completely brand new, right? And <laughs> you mentioned something which was very interesting around containerization. If you look at it from a technical standpoint, we have always approached, actually even DOD um, from the yellow book and all of that, we have always approached risk management from abstraction perspective. Well, yeah, we understand there is this infrastructure and then a platform sits on top and then you have a software, but every other thing is like, well, the software is within its own operating system. But now we are getting to a place where that abstraction in itself is kind of very ambiguous because you take containerization beyond the application, it's just basically on top of everything. You are not pointing the finger and say, oh, it's just within one VM. No, it could be within a lot of layers. And we have, assessors who do the compliance and we have system integrators who do the risk management constantly following these processes which was based which is designed to be based on abstraction literally as you're documenting you have to specify is it infrastructure platform or software as a service but containerization could be between those things right and we have no uh, processes for that but yeah um we are seeing progress a lot in a lot of fronts. I believe the Gov side is constantly pushing forward, but there will always be these. The reason why I kind of saying there will always be these, it's just the way things run. Se technology is going at a much faster rate than security. But at the same time, securing something that isn't even here can be very challenging in itself. I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible. Maybe someone might come out with a way, but the way I tend to say it is, we see the technology, we understand the gaps, the loopholes, the damage it could do, and also the benefits, then we start looking at it from, can we govern it? Uh, we cannot govern it, okay. Or maybe we already have things we can leverage towards governing it, but is the framework applicable, um, compliant? So, I mean, that's how I see it. DOD is bringing out CMMC, right? Um, that's more of a framework more on that side of risk management, not necessarily governance, but it's also on the FISMA, which is the governance. So does that kind of provide, I know it's kind of a long response, does it provide an answer to you? It does, and it's, it's, um, it's very interesting because what you're pondering are the things that um, are currently in discussions in my client space, because keeping up with tech and <sighs> making sure that old governance are, is still valid, um, is a question that we all are talking about and making sure that we're doing. Are we losing, Mr. Oh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah I can. Oh, I was just here, I was just reiterating that what you said is yeah. it makes sense and that we're having those yeah. kind of discussions now. No, I agree with you. I think the entire gov sector is honestly talking about the same thing in one form or the other, whatever we chose to call it or which who, whichever entity tries to push with what, which white paper one way or the other, you will find there are some interconnect connections between the problems we are all having, including the um, federal civilian space, national security, and also the private sector in some ways. Um, but yeah, I think Lawrence, you are trying to say something? I was basically gonna say that the, um... Everywhere we are, I'm in a governance. I'm in a, in a, in a government governance role, um, and we are we are reactive. It's defense because, like you were saying, technology moves so fast that we can't anticipate every offensive technology move that takes place. So we have to take it from. We ultimately not have to, but we end up taking it from, from a point of of defense. Once it happens, we'll put up the fence after they've run through the after a group has run through the run through. 
it would, like we're with the next coming through because everything is is reactionary because we can't we, we don't have the capacity to think of all the possible alternatives that come through um that that could occur so we just deal with what has occurred ultimately absolutely agree i think yeah certainly agree i don't know of the other folks uh, so so yeah this is frida i i work in government as well and i think there's layers to it i think that um not other not all government is cut the same way resources allocated the same way and the mission um with when it comes to compliance risk management um and governance it varies so for my particular organization, we definitely look at how we can decrease the attack surface, but maximize the operational surface, which is a balance. Um, accepting risk, definitely um, as upgrades and different standards come out, you know, sometimes I, I feel like we're living by the, the plan of action and milestones, like, yeah, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. But I think that, um, yes, we are heavy on the defensive side, but um there's layers to it and and not all government i mean for dod um i know at different you know you have the strategic the operational and tactical levels so depending on what level you're functioning on or how those resources go and how those atos those author authorizations to operate and you know some money is allocated and bandwidth and hiring you know and billets and that it is the priority and i think that they're doing better than what people really know and then other things are very much neglected. And I think that it's just a rack and stack on what's the priority. I My opinion. No, I agree with you uh, both. I agree that the majority of things are not responsive. Like we're not living in like an inst incident response kind of lifestyle in the sense of within the gov. Like the job is not always incident response, right? There are definitely more protection as well, like reducing attack surface. But even reducing attack surface, I guess what we are trying to add was that um, that is usually also done from a reactionary standpoint, not necessarily an attack has happened or an incident had happened, but more of like the progression of technology. Like we are reducing attack surfaces based on the technologies we know. And it only makes sense because we can't do what we don't know, right? It's not like we can secure a technology we don't even know yet. So, but I believe, like, yeah, I have the technology. Yeah. But so, quick, quick question. Oh, sorry. Well, I was going to head into the fact that isn't that part of the risk management, sort of like your zero trust principles, where you're not trying to come up with, you know, you're not 100% focused on ways of preventing the attack, so to speak. You're assuming that the attack is already occurring. So now what do I do? So in other words, you're never gonna to get to the point where you're going to prevent all attacks. I mean, just kind of accept that fact. And Zero Trust says, just um, assume that you're being attacked now. Okay, so somebody's in your system, H how do you want to yeah, I understand. You're talking about greater risk so scenarios. Is it, isn't that more about the, the offensive? Right. That's that's you're going on the um, offensive as opposed to just reacting. Instead of, you know, you're putting up, um, you're protecting your assets as if somebody's already in your system. Correct. That's absolutely fair. So let me add another layer to this. Don't think of it from attack. Don't think of it from... That think of it more from a research or advancement in technology, because zero trust and all of that, all of those approach we are doing, it's creating scenarios to anticipate what might happen so that we plan ahead, such that when it happens, we are in a better position. All of those is what we are trying to get to is that they are usually done based on our anticipation, sorry, based on our knowledge of the existing attacks that uh, out there, right? Or things that we know could happen. Does that make sense? But yeah, I, I it, think I follow you. But isn't it not necessarily just technology, but like, for example, no. insider threat, right? I mean, the, the fact mm -hmm. that you have insider threats, right? 
the, the governance, I think, requires you to separate roles and responsibilities so that nobody can really collude, right, and breach your security. So, the, so the, I mean, I was, isn't that sort of more on the governance side rather um, than on the... Well, it, it is on the governance side. And I think we're all saying the same thing. We are saying the same thing truly, and it is on the governance side, but it's still behind technological advancement. Does that make sense? Or no? Like, well, so it, does. it does, but can't we control as an organization? Okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, no, in some ways, no, no. so can't we? Hmm? Go, I ahead. Hate go ahead, Frida. Go ahead, Frida, please go ahead. Okay, so I'm just wondering from a compliance side, uh, can't we control, and, and I'm speaking from how, you know, I only have DOD background. Uh, we have approved product lists. So what you're going to put on my network, there's a list and that list has been vetted. And yes, there are vulnerabilities and threats and things that come out. And I know as we move into the cloud space, we're looking at, you know, Internet as a service and infrastructure as a service. But we're also controlling how we transition into that space. So the risk is minimized through the governance and the compliance standards. And you're still kind of, you know, I, I don't know, 28 years, I, I'm pro DOD. I try to see the good. If I'm not positive, I probably day drink and quit my job. But I just think that there's, there's measures and boundaries that we could put in to ease the impact of um, technology and the growth of it. Yes, we're behind in some of the stuff we have, um, you know, I won't say we can't protect against it, but they're, they're, it's a double-edged sword. You move too fast. Never, ever, ever will the government be the first to get something new. We want to see what happens. But there's also, you know, the Achilles heel. You don't want to be last either because that's a vulnerability of sorts. But I just feel like, you know, there, there's pros in it and, and slowing how fast you step into new technology. That's all. I want to quickly clarify something just for the other brother of the class. I, I I think we should, like, we are not selling this conversation to gov government specific because there is an absolute sense in why government should be led to the party in adopting newer things because the implications of the government consuming a much newer thing is beyond an organization going bankrupt, right? It could literally impact every one of us. So it absolutely makes sense from a strategy perspective. But also, the point around cyber governance is trailing technological advancement. It does not translate to we are doing bad in our cyber governments. governance. It just means that even going ahead in cybersecurity governance that we are able to do to plan ahead and whatsoever, we are constantly planning it based on the technology that exists that we know, even if it has if it's yet to be exploited. And it only makes sense that we cannot have cybersecurity governance go faster than technological advancement. And I'm not talking about cybersecurity technological advancement or attack kind of newer form of attacks. No, I'm just talking about cybersecurity in general. Let me give an example and then we can quickly move on. If you think of What's a new technology that in recent times? Let's use deep fix that just came out recently, right? 10 years ago, probably there wasn't anything like deep fix, right? So mimicking or copying someone's face and trying to impersonate them is not a thing from that same type of um, approach. As such, there could be no response or governance or way to handle it. And anticipating that we will have that and just have cyber governance way ahead of the technology could not have necessarily be applicable. Until deep fakes happened, even though it didn't cause much damage, until it came about, that's when we began to realize that we need to have some form of a governance in place that allows us to handle this if it goes, you know, crazy. So I guess that's the point we are trying to make, but I 100% agree that 
most of the work we are doing, including getting ATO in itself, it's absolutely not a response, but rather it's a proactive approach. Majority of what we do, be it in the government side of things or the public side, are constantly proactive approach to you know, cybersecurity. So yeah, I 100% agree. I hope it kind of makes sense now, what we are trying to <laughs> get to. Okay, and um, next is just, you know, basic. We keep talking about this governance, risk management and compliance and all of that. And um, there's a reason. So back when I used to give exams in this class, I used to tell everybody to print this or at least have it next to them while they take their exams. It's only because the goal of the class was to really constantly think at the high level, right? At that governance, senior management executive, just be the CEO. Like you're literally the CEO and see what is the right approach. So they are, I used to give like, you know, I would say um, examples that requires solution from a strategic viewpoint, but also has an answer in a technical implementation. And what we're looking for is that strategic approach, right? because that's the bigger picture. But the concept of these organizational roles is just for us to really put it in front of us and see where is governance, where does risk management happen? And those compliance and some part of the risk management in itself, where do they reside? But the CEO, they really don't participate much in that compliance or risk management. Their primary job is just to set the tone at the high level most times. Now, it is on them to make sure that things are being followed as well as the um, compliance is in place, right? But I mean, even for you uh, folks in the Gulf side as well as um, the public side, how many times do you see the president of the organization you know, their hand in the cookie jar jar in compliance, or maybe an assessment is going on and you're having like the organizational um, president or if it's the gov side, like the director being, you know, the person hands, you know, hardly. Their role will probably be part of when GAO comes into the picture and they are not in compliance now they do need to answer to probably a senate committee on why did they miss certain things now that's governance right so that's the part of their senior management they are accountable the executive side depending on where it is they also organizational leadership also are bound to answer to certain uh, entities if it's the gov side probably the answer to the congress on the public institutions, probably they answer to some board or stakeholders if they are public, if they are private, probably it could even be their customers or the industry they operate. You can have your own private company that is whatever you want, but if you operate in a certain type of industry, then you do need to follow certain type of regulations. Let me give an example. If you are in FinTech and you issue cards, then you do need to comply with PCI DSS. Um, you can have a cupcake business that is 100% yours, but you do need to abide probably by FDA's kind of regulations, Food and Drug Administration, right? So all of those are around that board and stakeholders. And uh, we have the senior management who sets the laws, the policies, and um, you can remove senior management here and now put organizational directors from a gov side of things and the other ones that drive it. And there are always the committee which tend to be external entities that are running the compliance side of things to ensure you abide by the rules in place. Now we do have, sometimes I usually say that annoying and toughest part, the mid-management, right? Who take all of those governance and now have to make sure it's implemented, it's in line with everything, it's in um, functioning as it's expected to on all of those. So those managers that will be the most conversant in these frameworks, being able to translate it. They might not be the ones 
to do the actual implementation, but they will be directing the traffic. And uh, at the end, we now have the different standard baselines. That's why you start getting like control baselines, what is the minimum requirement, the guidelines, and then um, like the procedure, if there is a step-by-step. -step. This is where instead of really getting or reading the ambiguous documents at that much higher level, you probably are looking up how do you set up Kubernetes in a secure fashion, right? And now you are looking at people that are within the IT space or on the other side, it could be operational. So you're now looking at HR, you're looking at even security guards, if there are like personal requirements and all of those, right? But most times I'm not saying, um, it cannot be interchanged, but you find that it's usually top-down approach, right? It's you find that it's much like institutions and entities abide by it when it follows a top-down approach. It's just like you as an employee, if someone at the low level or maybe a junior or below you says maybe we should stop connecting our devices to the Wi-Fi because there are chances of vulnerability. You might look at them and just shrug, you know, okay, fine. Please. It doesn't stop you, less impact. If the president of the organization said so, I assure you it's going to be, yeah, especially if you know you're gonna lose your job. So then it changes the tone. So we always try to take that top-down approach. And I know this is kind of basic for a lot of you that are executives, right? But for those of you that are actually starting in the field as well as going into um especially those of you that are coming straight from masters undergrad masters um you haven't um gotten the job experience yet you will come across all of these eventually you will begin to see how the bottom-up approach can be the most tedious thing i'm talking about technology cyber specific and then you will also see how the top-down approach usually um, is much more effective in bringing change. And uh, later on, we'll also get on those organizational culture, how the leadership respond to all of these kind of things will set the tone for how the employees comply with it. Yeah. And um, uh, any pointers? Anyone wants to add something? Yeah. All right. So, a um, couple of uh, governance things that exist, we mentioned them, right? Even in your organization, the high level policies are governance stuff. Um, here in the US, if you want to look at it, FISMA is a governance thing, HIPAA is a governance thing. Um, but next, a lot of governance related stuff. But what are the risk management stuff? Right? What are the risk management output? Because the governance doesn't tell you how to, the risk management does. So that's why we then start getting into those frameworks. Like if you know about NIST, you will care of the 800 series, um, like 800-37 is actually um, the RMF document. And then 53 sets the controls, but then also we have like different um, frameworks, right? In here, I kind of added some governance and some framework focus thing, but like FISMA, for example, that's more of a governance, but then you look at HIPAA is also a governance, but also uh, GDPR, as much as they have regulation in there, but it also set the tone. So it's also governance a little bit, but then we also have COVID, which is more controls. And um, DODSRG in the form is also the, um, security requirement guides for um, cloud service providers operating within the DOD sector. But then ICD-503 is like the RMF for the intelligence sector. Uh, but then HIPAA is a governance. 800 series is just a collection of documents and we'll touch high level on those, right? But CIS are also controls, not necessarily governance. So you come across a lot of them. Um, yeah, I'm trying to see, is there anyone that, uh, in here that is like an outlier. Yeah, SSAE is more like an auditing standard. But yeah, so a lot of them are in here. In this class, we will 
talk about the theoretical side of things using the Isaka approach, and then we will touch a little bit on the FISMA RMF, right? The only reason why we are also going with the FISMA RMF is as much as NIST kind of usually just put the documents out, so it's you have to read the NIST 800 37, not the most popular one, dash 53, to understand how to actually implement everything and follow the framework. It's it's still a little bit chaotic because there are so many 800 documents. So we'll touch a little bit of that, but it's also one of the most exhaustive approach. It's constantly, I mean, there is funding. That's one. So if there is money, you find things are moving, but um it gets a leverage all over, right? You can satisfy HIPAA by deploying uh, or rather implementing NIST controls. Um, so yeah. The ultimate creation and uh, the main objective of today's honestly overview is just for us to begin to see to begin to see like the purpose of cybersecurity and risk management within an organization is to add value, right? That's what we want. We don't want to see, like, we want to see cybersecurity and not just see, but we want to begin to understand how cybersecurity and cybersecurity risk management, cybersecurity governance add value to organizations, add value to achieving objectives rather than being this blocker constantly as much as pre is, uh, it is presented as a blocker all right because it does add value the consequences is a loss so we don't want that um we as we move further in this um on the isaka side of things how isaka op uh, often approach uh, risk management is through this, right? The risk identification and risk assessment and then responding to the risk. I'm not a big fan of the word mitigation there because mitigation in itself sounds like taking an action. You can respond to a risk without taking any action, but we'll discuss that. And um, the risk and control monitoring, right? But we'll just say risk monitoring for now. We will cover these all of these in detail, like how do you identify risk? How do you assess risk? How do you respond to risk? And we are not going to use the NIST approach. Nope. We are going to use the public space, like the ISACA approach, more on the enterprise side of things. And on the hands-on, we will then deploy the NIST approach. So at least it gives us the theoretical side and the technical side of things. I usually say, for the executives here who are like either you are three PAO or you are a system developer or you are an executive or whatever it is, there's a little bit of everything for you. But what I like the best is you will get to experience the pain of the other side. Because if your job is constantly to, you know, tell those engineers like, hey, implement this in this version, put this documentation, and you are just I'm not saying just to minimize, but if you are an AO and you just tend to set some ridiculous timeline, so things move forward, or maybe you go out for months in, on vacation because you don't have much insight into how, I know it's what document or documentation, but how challenging SSPs can be, you will, you will do a little bit of it, right, in here. But at the same time, I'm not trying to, I used to actually, I used to say that everybody must build an ATO package, but then other folks gave me some feedback that I began to realize it's truly not knowledge, Jibbo. it's more of just a bureaucratic process. Uh, it can be a better way. So that's why in the project in this class, I was asking of, you get to choose which role you want to play. You can be an engineer, you can be someone who, build the package in a form of a report, and then you can be the person presenting it to leadership, right? And by the leadership, I mean, if you wanna secure some funds for relating to cybersecurity or for your unit to deploy some cybersecurity related stuff, you do need to present it to leadership. That's why we'll have a presenter 
persona in those sites. Any question on this, please? No, Dr. Doc, Wazir is veto. I'm sorry? I, I agree 100%. I agree 100% um, with regards to presenting to executives. So I've, I've, helped, I've helped a lot of clients um, create risk assessments and uh, they've requested, can you please present this to our executives or our boards? Because it'll have a lot more clout if it comes from you because you're an outside consultant, which you know I don't agree with. I, I, sometimes you have very smart people that work with, with companies, right? But this is how they think. And unfortunately, when you, you, know, when you go up there and you present it, very high level heat maps of why X amount of dollars is required then they understand, oh, okay, we're okay with that. So it's, it's funny though, how things work. I 1000% agree with you, Vito. I think um, <laughs> until I joined consulting, before Microsoft, I was with Deloitte a little bit, I think I mentioned it in the other class. So until I joined consulting, that's when I began to realize there is a huge, tremendous value in having that person who's able to speak to the board, because all, honestly speaking, it's not knowledge. It's not just the content, it's marketing, right? Um, you find, the, as you uh, rightly mentioned, you find the executive respond more to if you present everything from how it adds value rather than discontinuous protection. It took me a while and I'm still learning it because I don't have the marketing skill, but I understand the value of it. But truly it's a form of marketing. And what I began to realize is engineers and implementers are not the best talkers. <laughs> and then also those people that build the packages and understand the pain of the process can be so attached to it. So all of those, I kind of have experienced it, especially when it comes to defending um, proposals and showing why you deserve to get it. But yeah, I agree. Anybody you wanna kind of add? Please, I'm looking, is there any executive or an implementer who can share what exactly is your pain point? Seriously, is there any implementer who feels like, why are these executives doing things this way? I think I will then say, I don't know who point to. Earlier, there was one executive who sits, who will find it. You know, cause a little fight in the class. Anybody want to chime in? Nobody? Oh, that's a question. Frida, what, uh, are you more on the executive side of things? Like, do you build, uh, do you approve it or do you build the packages or do you implement? Uh, myself, uh, well, I, uh, I myself, no. uh, well, First of all, of course, I would do the overall assessing uh, and provide the information. So it's more of an advisory uh, and also um, uh, really reporting to the to the executives and, and to the board. Once that's complete and it's all accepted, my company also has a branch that does the implementation. Now, that implementation could be technical. It could be operational. It could be administrative where they need a lot more policies or they need a framework created or perhaps they need... Um, to shore up their cloud security, which could include, uh, you know, uh, multi-factor authentication, uh, zero trust abilities, things like that. So it's really across the board, but at the end of the day, you're right though, it starts from the top. Uh, I, I truly believe in the top-down approach um, because really you're following the company's mission, the company's um, uh, really what the executives require to ensure that the business is successful. So I, I agree with that, of course. I mean, a classic example of a top down. I mean, we just saw it. Look at it. Um, the administration just released an executive order, and all of a sudden, Microsoft and Google and Apple are just allocating much more money in cyber security. I'm like, that's top down for you. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, yes. Please, I want to add, I know you went off mic earlier. Uh, about your role. I mean, please, you don't have to overshare. I was just asking, just for now, you know. See if other people no. also want to know who should I go to for my group stuff. But yeah. Oh, That's, no worries. Thanks. Well then. Frida? Yeah, sorry, I just didn't want to jump in. So many people were talking. So uh, at my organization, I am a senior government civilian. Uh, as far as decision making, because the type of work that I do in current operations, 
a lot of the decisions come from a playbook or framework framework that's already established within the confines of how we operate. Um, as far as new initiatives, uh, yes, we're a part of that. We're doing some stuff this week um, where we're trying to implement uh, different AI um, uh, technology for some uh, current operations information feeds that we're looking at. So yes, decision making. Yes, uh, a lot of contractors slash vendors come and pitch. I work with organizations like MITRE, uh, I, I could name them all, but we have contractors that come and offer different services as well, but definitely on the decision-making end of it. Does that answer your question? Oh, yeah, no, I mean, it wasn't even a precision question. I'm just trying to understand, like, the class um, skill set, but that's amazing. I guess if people in the class are looking for who to go to to understand if their presentation is very convincing, now you have it. <laughs> so this is great. That's amazing. Hello, hello, Professor. Um, this is this is um Frank Clinical. I would like to just say okay. a few words. Yeah. Um, no, so um it. yeah. So um um my experience is on the compliance space, right? You know, as um part of the the Office of Inspector General. You know, so um pretty much you know we ensure provide some sort of oversight. You know, ensure you know whatever governance you know risk assessment that has been identified have been implemented. You know. Because as you guys rightly said, I mean, we have so many policies. We have so many policies, you know, you talk about NIST, there are so many, you know, and folks are doing the risk assessment, you know, but trust me, you know, I mean, when it comes to implementing some other things, I think that's where um, the problem is, you know. So so I, I was looking at the, 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 the governance piece, right? Risk and then oversight. I believe, you know, oversight, I, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit, you know, because I'm in the oversight piece, you know, I think oversight is more important, you know, in terms of ensuring, you know, whatever, whatever policies, risk assessment, you know, have been identified, you know, they're following through the risk, et cetera, et cetera. Even with, with the risk, you know, sometimes, you know, the identify risk, you know, put it in a poem, right? And that's it, you know, so it's so easy for folks to just put things in a poem and that's the end of it, you know, I mean, to go back and, and do the reassessment and things like that. So. I'm more on the oversight piece, which I think is very important, you know, in terms of, you know, um, you know, adding value when it comes to cybersecurity. Over. I agree. I 100% agree. And I think um, uh, first, before I chime in, please, uh, everybody in the class, because we are putting, we tend to put this on YouTube so later on other folks can see, um, just reminding everybody. Um, if there is a need for you to be mindful on how you share, right? I don't want to be the reason why someone has overshared. But I 100% agree with you on that oversight. I think oversight, um, as you rightly mentioned, it's a huge, huge uh, aspect of ensuring compliance in itself. Even though it has this, um, it's more of a government thing. Like, I'm not saying there are no oversight in the public space, like, cooperation and everything, but you find it much more in the government space due to corruption, like ensuring there's no corruption because it's a nonprofit entity. Uh, most of these places are nonprofit. So, I mean, looking at oversight started from budgeting, right? Ensuring people are not misusing funds and whatsoever. And it does have a place in cybersecurity as well. And there is a huge component of it that ensures compliance, but yep, you are absolutely correct. Um, maybe you should actually change compliance oversight, but yeah, 100% agree with you on that. That's uh, thanks for sharing as well. Yeah, um, we'll have a lot of chats like next week. I'm actually looking forward to one of our discussions regarding the executive order. Now, I want to add this um, for those of you that. If you're an international student or you have zero thing to do with US government, bear with us. I know we we folks from the Gov, we like to talk about the Gov side. It's the, you know, it's our thing, right? But um, what I'm trying to get to is there will be a mixture of conversations. Even in the discussions, we will introduce issues that are completely out of the US Gov. We will also introduce international stuff. Like, um, I mean, look at the hack that happened in Saudi Aramco. That's a big deal, right? We'll touch on things like that. Um, we are talking about cybersecurity governance. We've been talking about US Gov and we can we tend to forget actually US Gov's um, policies and governance is 
really matured, uh, very, very matured, actually. Um, there are a lot of places that have fallen behind. Um, probably it's because it's not their priority or probably, you know, lack of funds, you name it. Um, a lot of places in Africa are really actually doing well in data regulations, but there are other aspects like incident response that they are not prioritizing. Um, the international organization recently, World Bank released, uh, well, it's no longer recently, but it's like um, two years ago, they released their strategy towards digital development and there's a huge component of cybersecurity. Um, UN consolidated, it's like, um, the terrorism unit to now include something like cybersecurity. So we'll introduce all of those perspectives. Well, places like Iran, they are really, really, depending on how you want to see it, but they are into it, right? Russia, China, there are all of these big players, whether from, we are seeing it from a reactive perspective, a proactive or regulation or whatever, we will keep introducing these from uh, within the topics. And please, 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 if you have experience in that, chime in, share, right? We'll discuss all of those. We'll also get into the technical side of things. Um, and by technical, I do mean technical. True, true technical, hands-on understanding, right? Uh, I'm actually as a question around the big three, Cloud providers. Um, well, let's say the big two. Anyway, we'll, we'll pity Google and include them. But anyway, the big three <laughs> uh, AWS, Azure, and um, GCP. We are now having a different strategy, which is governance in itself, uh, which is cybersecurity governance. We are now having a different strategy towards cloud adoption by consumers. In, in the sense that they don't want to have a single point of failure. Nobody wants to put their egg in one basket. So that hybrid concept of like a hybrid deployment is truly a thing, right? And you have all of these big entities who are all racing each other. Now let's remove the political side of things. As an engineer, how would you begin integrating, say, I'm just throwing things, maybe Arjo AD, and uh, now you want to have it directly with Kubernetes within GCP. And then also there is maybe as a federated identity. And now you have the Azure v, um, maybe a VM running within an EC2 instance within AWS. And you want to use your um, you know, identity and access, like I, your IAM solution, you want to use Azure AD and probably there is maybe Azure AD doesn't integrate with that. All of those now, how do we begin to approach it? So, because that's all part of hybrid cloud computing and it's becoming a thing. So how are we going to handle that? All of those topics from a technical standpoint, we will introduce it, right? Um, it's no longer much of a thing, but it's becoming a bit outdated, but we do have proprietary solutions, right? <laughs> Somebody should talk to Cisco. I think they have learned their lesson from that. Uh, Cisco devices used to be a lot proprietary from switches, routers, whatsoever, where one device will not necessarily work with a non-Cisco device. Palo Altos, they have taken up so much because of their interoperability kind of thing. How do we approach that? Um, you have devices like maybe, I don't know, Apple versus, <laughs> versus everybody, I would say now, versus everybody, because it was versus Facebook versus whatsoever. I think I was seeing another with Epic Games, App Store. All of these are cybersecurity related. We'll keep introducing them. So please, if you are here in Gulf, it's just one side that we we kind of, touch upon today and probably again tomorrow, sorry, next week, but you will have a lot of other side. We are not short of topics that I can assure you. Um, so can we all take maybe 15 minutes break and then come back at 8.15 Eastern time? And uh, what I would like to do is go over the class again, not just class by the way, um, like Canvas and whatsoever the progress we've made, I still need to push out, uh, rather we still need to, myself unfortunate, push out more content. 
but I want to kind of show the discussion board. I see some of you have already um, kind of started adding your comments. Um, discuss a little bit of the report, what we are trying to get to by next week. And then also uh, the poll. I see a lot of you actually enjoy sitting in your pajamas. Let me guess, maybe you're just sitting back eating chicken wings or maybe eating nuggets, right? Because I'm the only one with my video here. So. I'm not sure, but it's okay. Uh, I see a lot of people have voted that they rather continuously have it online. We'll look into that as well. So yeah, let's take 15 minutes and be back at 8.15. Fortune, we can pause the recording. Management perspective, you know, yeah. purchasing insurance might be less costly Cheaper. than implementing you know, all those um, exactly controls. Yep, but if we have I, a lot I, in place, that changes the game. Sorry, go ahead, Lloyd. I agree. Uh, I quick agree. question. But there has to yes. be more enforcement, more fines. That's the problem. And they're not. It, 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 the government builds all these uh, executive orders, which, of course, we, we read one this week. And that's great. But so many days, did you read, did you notice how many days they give you to do certain things? And then when you can't comply to it, you have to write down items on what you can't comply to. How about you just put enforcement and fines and I will tell you something. That's it. We, we actually have no governance around data breach that is due to neglect. It's not like we haven't seen what happened to Equifax or BP or whatever, all of these, yeah. including yeah. Target and whatever. We do not have governance around um, data uh, like around breaches due to neglect. So, and that's the question time, though, time to GPR things. <laughs> well, that's a different society, but yeah. Sorry, Sorry. Brian, what was it before I. No, no, I just want to say that, but um, today, aren't civil suits kind of taking the place of some of that governance that you're referring to? That companies now are starting to get these massive civil suits from those PII data breaches. So that all of a sudden they're starting to think, okay, well, wait a minute, our customer data is a little bit more important than we thought and it needs to be protected mm -hmm. because we're losing billions of dollars based on these massive civil suits that we're getting. So yeah, that's great. I actually don't know much about that, but I do have one to add and off I will go off the rail a little bit and add a comment. If there's any lawyer in the class who is worried about, do I have a place in this class? Now that's a classic example of why you fit in cybersecurity. That's law. <laughs> but yeah, no, this is um, good. And we'll have a lot of them. Please don't let me hijack the conversation. Honestly, constantly bring in your perspectives. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a different time. And I think that's what's making the entire cybersecurity field a hard field in the sense that there are so many things that needs to be addressed without an idea of how it will be done. Either yeah. we don't have an idea or we are unable to do all at once. So yeah, sorry, has someone was trying to say something? Has it, oh, I was just gonna say, has it changed that much though? I mean, it's always sort of revolved yeah. around game theory you know, right? Like whoever has the biggest, you know, cyber cyber gun or the strongest cyber shield is gonna, is gonna win and it just, you know. I mean, from I, a cyber I, I, warfare. What? Sorry, go ahead, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say like, I mean, it, I, I think like, I don't know. I, I, I think. I think technology is like put us into this like kind of like personal and professional and societal like cold war where like everybody's just sort of like racing to you know build the biggest like build the biggest bomb and they can do that in this world because like you know from a theoretical perspective like nobody dies when somebody gets hacked you know like so the consequences of like until you watch the until you watch homeland and see how a pacemaker is getting hacked. Homeland and see how a pacemaker is getting Yeah, I, I I would argue yeah, I there's huge ramifications with breaches, compromise, and cyber events when you're talking about cyber warfare 
uh, phrase yep. call, coin cybernetics. Um, it's a subset of kinetic war. And so if there is a hack into SICKER, into infrastructure, and it turns out the lights, and we know that country doesn't have night vision goggles, um, yeah, so I don't know. Or the water plants, I mean, the list can go on and on, the food systems. There's, yeah, yeah I think I, there's real there's real costs to cyber, to, to being hacked. And I think that that cost that's associated to it is because we don't have a clear understanding of what that means. Because people, for example, I think when we're talking about security, people say, oh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna patch this exploit. But if, but in actuality, because I used to do a lot of threat hunting, a lot of red team and blue team on networks to basically act like the hacker remote into people's boxes and personal systems, it's easier than you think because no one follows the best practice of a system. Nobody. Yeah, like, I, because convenience always wins. I kind of disagree with the ramifications of hacking though. Yeah, there clearly are geopolitical ramifications when major hacks happen. But I think that's just sort of like the tip of the iceberg. You know, I think there's so many unknown, unknown compromises that it would be like Indiana Jones if we sort of ever figured it out because like the amount of like information and like, you know, sort of psychological damage that could do would like make our heads explode. I I, th I think that I I think that oh sorry there's an echo, um, yeah I, I I just think that we've we've all sort of reached this point of acceptance with with our our security and you know we we're, we've reached a status quo sort of understanding that like as long as human nature wants to you know sort of build and conquer and destroy you know that's that's the sort of direction security tools are going to follow so uh now we'll make this comment and we'll definitely switch to class um but so daniel i think on the war front right we can't deny the fact that technology is weaponized i mean go with countdown to zero day right on stuxnet and whatever we definitely have seen that and we have seen it's implications beyond what Harkin and B Bridge can do. And truthfully, Stuxnet is a bridge. Um, however, the other side, I don't know, maybe to certain parts, like we were talking on that privacy. I think with privacy, I 100% agree that we are a bit complacent and we have you know, kind of accepted it as a society to a certain extent, and it's going to keep getting accepted, especially with the newer generations. Um, TikTok didn't even become more popular until people began having, like until the government started having concern about it, that's when it became, it continuously became a thing, right? But there is also a lot of significant progress in the field, no kidding. Be it on the governance or the technical side of things. Uh, I mean, I, don't forget just as, sorry? I think there's only gonna be progress as long as the sort of vested interests allow it. So- That's where I was getting to. I actually don't see it as a vested interest. If we want to quantify progress within the US, then a general quantify, uh, like a general progress that is considered progress will be when we find the balance between cybersecurity and profit making. When we know, like when we are able to fully quantify that yes, cyber is actually saving you money, not necessarily just compliance with the law. Because if it's compliance with the law, then we will continuously identify loopholes. That's how it works, especially the U.S. It's just like the tax system, you know. You know, I don't think so it's, <laughs> I don't I don't think it's saving like the right people money though. Like I think that the biggest cyber weapons mm -hmm. right now are Facebook and Twitter, and you know they get their engagement if you look at their numbers like five or six fold from like conspiracy theories to you know to to like actual like factual news articles like 
Now you have they, they're the per, they are Facebook and Twitter are the perfect cyber weapons for like propagating a public health crisis, and that's exactly what we're seeing. And their vested yeah. interest is in their profit, and that lies mm -hmm. with engagement, and that means allowing anti-vaccine content to propagate on their <laughs> on their network. Um, okay, but I think there's I think oh, there's I more. Go ahead, go ahead. So sorry. Uh, because we're up on time and I need to share this uh, class. So if you can um, round, round it up, so sorry, not trying to rush you. But uh, after I share the class, we can definitely come back and continue. But yeah, go on. I'm listening. Yeah, I think there's more money on the black market for um, vulnerabilities than there is for on the, you know, sort of, you know, IRS regulated market for, for finding them. Um, you know, if you look at the amount of money that's concentrated in, you know, autocratic regimes, in regimes which suppress political dissent and their market share of that, if you look at, you know, the biggest tech companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, you know, Amazon, you know, Alibaba, like where they do business is the most profitable in you know illicit ways um and they rely on that engagement and it makes them money um so again i don't think this will ever necessarily be a question of security and governance around a specific technology i think the real cyber war is within ourselves and within our you know own nature um that's fair I think the world definitely we can deny the impact of be it good or bad or how we chose to see it morally. Um, we can deny the impact of technology in our lives. Um, I do want to add one thing though, and I'll let you go look it up. I want you to go look up the business model of companies that make money based on ads you will begin to realize the content and the persona is not necessarily the money-making thing, rather the engagement and interactions are. So what I'm trying to get to is someone who is pro-vaccine pro or against vaccine tweeting it on Twitter will not necessarily generate Twitter money, rather it will allow, like their engagement with the platform is what makes the money. Right? So their ability to now customize the art based on what that person is doing is what makes the money, not necessarily the ethical views or moral views or whatsoever of that person. So how do they then ensure that they keep that person engaged? It's much more important with what type of content would that individual put out. Does that make sense, what I'm getting to? Now, I'm not saying there are no folks who are not monetizing that, but I'm saying the business model usually differs. There are those who have incentives in such a crowd place, like a crowd marketplace, and you begin to realize it might not necessarily be Facebook or Twitter as you think. It's actually a separate entity that is also leveraging Facebook and Twitter as a tool. I'm not pro Facebook or pro Twitter or pro tech, for example, in itself. But I think still, as we continuously go into cybersecurity, we go further, and especially if we're trying to govern it, there is a huge importance in understanding the inner workings of it so that we approach the governance side of it from regulation laws and whatsoever in the right manner. That's one of the biggest challenges we are now having. We have people in Congress and people who are able or who want to drive governance, but they have no understanding of it. And now how they are getting informed, it's actually either love it or skewed. I don't know if I'm making sense. Again, I'm being overly philosophical, but I'm gonna switch to um, the class. We will have quite a lot of um, time to discuss this. Um, please, if anybody have any other point, put a pin on it. If you have some time, we'll cover it all. Cycle back on it another day, but good catch up from 15 minutes to 30 minutes break, ha. Huh. Okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing. And uh, once I do that, I will let you know um, 
fortunate to begin recording. Give me a second. So uh, this is just, uh, I believe, give me a second, please. I'm trying to identify my screens so that I know what's next, right? And this is the end of this slide, the last part of the class. Uh, if you don't mind, please, everybody, give me just a second. We'll be joining. So um, I believe everybody is familiar with Canvas. We I quite a lot of contents. I already sent out a detailed email. Unless there is unless anything is not uh, unclear, I will not necessarily go over it. But please let us know if um, you need clarification on anything. However, I do want to kind of quickly go over here, right? I see some of you have started adding comments. This is where we are going to be commenting uh, on the responses to basically this uh, cybersecurity discussion specific to the executive order that was recently released, right? And I will keep introducing more topics. I <clears throat> I'm still trying to kind of come up with more contents. My goal is absolutely just put everything out there so people are able to um, face themselves as they move forward with all of these, right? Now, there is the grouping thing. Please do not forget, I see that three people have already kind of, you know, this group is full and there are other ones that um, just go to the people side of things and uh, drag yourself or right, I'll say your name into the group that you would like to be a part of. I want to quickly share my screen here and show you a couple of um, pages, okay? So, oh, great. Um, I see a couple of you have already uh, selected your group. I know I pre-populated the ones that were already in Canvas, but please uh, go update it. Now over here, project presentation or tech report. That's two things. Tech report is separate, pre project presentation is separate. So please, um, the people that are within the group should make a decision and just kind of remove the all part and just finalize. If you're presenting, you're presenting, and if you're um, documenting the report, you're documenting the report. Uh, the template for the report is not yet out, and uh, we have not proposed any project topics, but if you guys have any ideas, just go put it in there and let us know. We'll Look into it. Okay. Can we propose our own project topics? Yeah, that you're actually expected to propose your own project topic. I'm not giving oh, you. Oh, awesome! Topic. Cool, because yeah. I um I have something I really want to do, so I'll I'll run it by my group members. I will say yeah, perfect. That's it then. So long as you run it with your group members and you guys are all in sync, I don't think you will see any objection on our part. Um, just bring us on board. Uh, just have to um has to have a technical implementation component as well as uh, there will have to be a report and then someone must present it. Um, so over here, now earlier I'm, I showed this, right? Uh, where is my canvas? Let me come back here. So we are having this discussion and everybody's gonna go and comment, which is due by Friday, by the way following the class requirements, right? And I will show the rubric. Actually, let me do it now. Earlier, someone asked, how can you see the rubric? If you just go here, show rubric, it shows you, right? There will be two points for the comments. And this will be the rubric for everything. Sorry, ever deliverable will have its rubric if you go here and just check show rubric. Now, let me see something. If from the student view, you can also see the rubric. Yep. You can, so you can just show a rubric and that it is. Um, once this is complete, or rather after Friday, Friday at 12 p.m. Eastern time is the due date for everybody to comment. There will be one person who will kind of go through it, the different comments, and basically form a single summarized report. That summarized report should capture people's response, either agree, disagree, add to it whatsoever, but it should form a story. And I have written um, kind of the requirements. Now, how do we decide who is going to write the report for this? 
um, say like the second discussion on modes or about the discussion on module two, it's why we have this spreadsheet. So Daniel, I assume you are familiar with the requirements. That's why you selected your name as here. Yep, if I want not, to go first. Okay. And um, so do, I need to do I need to comment as well? This no, week? we do not. Okay. Nope. Cool. You will not comment, even though on your final like grid sheet, you will see like there are 11 discussions, but you have missed one, which makes sense because the total you should be able to get is 20. That's, you have to only do 10. So you do not need to comment at all. Um, like module five here, two people can definitely write a report, but they are not going to collaborate. So it's going to be separate thing. Obviously, we will by reading it, we will see a different um, perspective, different approach. Um, we'll see how it goes. I guess maybe if it's where on privacy, maybe Mister's approach will be from we are oversharing, and if it were government and freedoms writing it, I will see maybe we'll see EOD. Anyway. <laughs> um, uh, what would I say? I think someone commented. Please, uh, I apologize. I uh, will um, catch up with all the comments if it's a question in a bit. So yeah, now where do we submit the report? Because some of us then have things, I guess. We just enjoy the field so much that we want to catch up on everything. Um, I would like the report to be submitted as a comment here, such that anybody that is interested can basically go download it and read it, right? All of you. I, it's not just a deliverable to myself. This is just a way for us to, you know, add knowledge. If you are that executive, get yourself informed here. If you want to get off Twitter, so you now are on following cybersecurity news, maybe this will keep you updated a little bit. But yeah, the idea is please reply. Uh, so it will be something like this uh, from a student view. You can just reply here and by attaching, right? You submit it and attach the file and that's it. Many please do not go into the, I don't think, I think I've disabled it, so that's fine. Yeah, there should have been um, an upload button as the assignment. So this is perfect. That way anybody, no, sorry, everybody can go see the report if they want to download it. There is no requirement for everybody to read the report. But if you want to get informed or you're interested in the topic or it's aligned with your dissertation, maybe we're talking about Africa and uh, uh, maybe cybersecurity in Kenya and Edwin want to do a research, that's another data point for him. So that's fine. We'll use it. Can I um, ask um, one more question? And this is skipping ahead a little bit, but say you have your final report topic that you want to start because you already know what you want to do. Um, is that template posted? No, no, the template is not posted uh, yet, but that's just a formatting thing. If you have an idea of what final strategy people you want to write, just let's set up 15 minutes, um, reach out via email and we'll just quickly sync. And if, well, if I'm okay, like, right, if we reach an agreement with like the paper where you're trying to write it from, then that's totally fine. Let's just set up 15 minutes and catch up on it. Cool. Thanks. Hopefully to also send us an abstract for a start if you want, or if you have it, just capture the idea and we'll take it further. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I'll, I'll shoot you an email. Shilton, and please also add fortune to the all emails. Um, so there's this. Again, I am seeing the comments. I will kind of cycle back on it. So let's look and <laughs> take a look at the poll. I was sitting back at home in my... PG and I figure might as well, you know, throw it in there, but um there's a second. It seems like, yeah, only three people for the next class on this. I'll keep looking at it all the way through Saturday or Sunday. And if we're able to get maybe eight people, then probably we might meet in person. But if there's none, then yep. But from the looks of things, it's just a bunch of red, red, red. So everybody just wanna sit in their pajamas and eat chicken nuggets, so good for you. Um, oh, I had this link. So these are just different compliance 
I would say risk management frameworks as well as um, existing governance, regulations, laws whatsoever a lot. I'm not selling Microsoft, but I kind of like this page sometimes where it shows different things from a global or which ones are US focused. There are also regional like US, um, Asia Pacific. I think there should be something EU around GDPR. We should see something like that. Um, not sure, but it should be. Or maybe GDPR is global. I don't see. Maybe I'm just Russian. But yeah. Oh, okay. Regional around EU. So yeah, it's here. I kind of like this page, but I know um, Amazon as well have like their compliance page where it shows based on services. These are all regulations or frameworks that they are in compliance with. Google also has something like that, either from a global or just. No, you can apply the filters. So let's see like education industry, there is far far, obviously. This is what allows me, or this is what stops me from passing on you guys grades and transcript to Facebook to sell, I guess. I'm just kidding. I don't know about that. And then, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember there's one more thing. Yep, so over here, when you, Get the chance I already mentioned, but please go identify your group and begin working on it in the sense of just sync with your group. We will keep pushing contents as much as we can. And this is how, like this in person, sorry, this lecture video. So we are uploading the videos like this lecture as well. We will upload it to um, YouTube. If you want to catch up with it again later, then we, um, you can just play it. I think this is the one from, the kickoff intro. Yep, absolutely it is. All right, let me quickly pull up the comments and see. Can you please go back to show how you go to the sign up sheet? Um, so the sign up sheets and all class resources that are not um, lecture related or discussions will be here. So like the syllabus is here, overview deck. So the sign up sheet is here. Just click here, it will take you there. Um, I am certain I saw an email. Someone is trying to access it from a personal email. You have to use your marimon.edu. Student names, I don't know if it's part of FARPA, but I'm not about to be the one that allowed stu <laughs> students of fall 2021 name be out there. <laughs> but me, that's compliance. Anyway, uh, please use your marimon.edu to access these and you'll be able to edit it and all of that. Uh, what next? Oh, this you don't need to worry about it, but if you are interested in to know what we have already done and we haven't done, please, this is not a major thing, but uh, I'm capturing for myself, the class is entirely open source. Um, I'm capturing it for myself as a tracker, Fortune is, following and capturing it as well. So if you are interested in knowing, have we created the template? Have we whatsoever? Feel free to use the class project page. I think um, I'm thinking of inviting guest speakers to talk about cloud security governance uh, as well as the planning side of things and also the incident response side of things. Maybe some colleagues to come give us a talk on how they do it. A uh, couple of topics. I'm, planning to propose related to the strategy paper. Um, Fortune has some grading around the weekly discussions, comments to do. To do. I tend to grade the reports, he grades the comments, and then um, the intro that people did, uh, that will be graded, so like the hands-on activities, and whatsoever, grading it. There are a couple of other items, and these are what we have done. So if you wanna just, just a basic Kanban board for the class that we created, absolutely, you. This is not part of class. This is just for my, uh, I'll say for our tracking, but if it's going to allow you to be updated, that's it. Any other questions? Anything On the, um, how, how yeah. did you pull up the Azure um, compliance list that you did? I was so busy this looking one. at the. Mm -hmm. It's right here. Both Fortune and I, Microsoft, so maybe we are selling. Maybe we are not. Who knows? Maybe we are. 
But I'll give you that up, Amazon, so you don't say I'm biased. <laughs> uh, any questions? Anyone? Someone said they can access the poll. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm only seeing the comment as, uh, is it Edward? But let me quickly see why you're not accessing the poll. It should be open. Um, yeah, we added the link to the, are you sure you're signed into your marimon.edu email? Because the poll is here. Go to the modules. Um, yeah, in person meeting poll. Look here. Oh, I didn't know you can even it open. Oh, so I responded already. Oh, I didn't know. But yeah. Any other question? Anyone? I have a quick question for the Go groups. For uh, okay. Um, I so there's the Excel spreadsheet, but then there's also the dynamic group. Um, mm -hmm. that's on the group page and the people page, those things are not mm -hmm. in sync. So would you rather we do the spreadsheet or would you rather we do it on the group section? So so there are just a limitation on Canvas where it doesn't allow us identify like over oh, this group one, sorry, I'm using showing you guys name, but like this group one, I, we wouldn't be able to track because Vito working on the technical side of things, the report or he's the presenter. That's why we created this spreadsheet. Ideally, it definitely, so please, if you move, uh, put your name there, just align it with the group here. And I believe the group will agree on which task you're taking on. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Um, Canvas limitation. That's what's happening. I wish we can even create polls on Canvas. It's kind of funny that we can do it, or maybe I'm just not invested enough into it to find out. But yeah. Now, any other question, please? Anybody? Uh, I see one other, sorry, before the most recent comment, I see sorry. another that said, um, sorry, how did you get to this page again? It's just an email, so I'm not sure who made that comment, but can you tell me which page is it that you wanna know how we got there? J0B email. Maybe you're mid. How do we know what group we are in? Yakira, you sign up. You go sign up. Uh, if there are, like, right now, there are a couple of folks in the class that we, you know, strategically identify the script uh, skill set. So maybe you can ping them and form a group. Assuming you're technical, we, we have had a couple of things from people that are more presenters and uh, some that are more and that reports out of things on executives. So. But you just sign up yourself. That's it. I believe the class is- I have a, a question. Yes, I go ahead, Julia. So I was a late add to the class and I was told that it was online, but I'm understanding that now we're doing it asynchronous and synchronous. So. I'm in Hawaii and right now there's a six hour time difference. And so I leave work at 1230. Um, just wondering if there is a penalty for a missing class, if I can do like every other class or half a class, or I'm trying to figure out how to consistently attend, but it's in the middle of my work day. So. And that's yeah. absolutely fair. Um, oh, sorry, that's absolutely unfair in the sense that the time zone, especially for those who like to engage now for, Let's start with penalty. Absolutely not. <laughs> Who am I to give a penalty for a PhD class? Come on. Um, but then also, uh, we will continuously record the classes and engagements. And uh, even though it's not the same as an in-person experience to people who really want to converse, that's why we kind of created the discussion board for, I know it's not interactive because it can be overly chaotic, but it was just meant to supplement some of these type of conversation that are happening. Um, I'm trying to think of days where maybe what my- So I'm definitely going to prioritize it. I just, I'm sorry? so the class is the priority. I said, so I'm definitely going to prioritize it. And I don't know how many people in this session are like in a different time zone, but because it's so significant with the six hours, um, if something happens, um, it works. Sometimes my life is not my own. So right now I'm scheduled until December 17th to depart at a certain time, but there are issues, real world implications that sometimes 
you know, and I'm not planning for it, but most likely there'll be one or two that I miss. I want to say this, please. I do mean it, not a joke. Do not prioritize the class, prioritize the most important things. The class is the least most important thing. I kid you not. Um, do not worry about um, you have to attend in person. That's not a thing. Like, um, um, can everybody go mute this? There's an echo on my side. Um, we don't have to um, attend in person. And even if we were to eventually vote for a day that we are going to meet in person, the experience will not differ for you because we are going to use some of those media classrooms that allow us to stream the class while also being in person. And also, you're not the only one who is um, out of uh, like state. There are a couple of those. Last semester, I took someone who was deployed somewhere in Asia. And uh, yeah, um, if there is anything you need that will allow some, like whatever it is, please just know we will accommodate it all the way to the point of if it means putting a pause in the class till whenever, so be it. Uh, do not prioritize the class. Now, if you want in person or if you want engagement experience, sorry, engagement yeah, experience, like how we were conversing, that's one of the reasons why I'm trying so hard to push out all the topics that will give people an idea of the days that we will talk of certain topics and we should then be probably they should be able to plan it and if it's unplanned then um if you have some ideas willing to hear it on how we'll keep you engaged i don't know if that answers your question perfect thank you You're welcome any questions anybody um anything anyone no can you navigate back to the weekly discussion every i'm seeing it's blocked on my side, but maybe I'm missing something. Yes, you're not supposed to see anything until you respond to it because no, of I don't two see things. The questions. Okay, there it is. Go. No, you should see the question only, but you should not see people' response. I found two things. <clears throat> the first time, no, the first two times I taught this class, like my first and the second time, I found that every time I submit my comment or I engage. The entire conversation sway to us that direction. I assure you, I am not the most knowledgeable, nor do I know these things a lot. Like some of the students I've interacted with <laughs> outside of this class, they are going to employ me. I kid you not. Uh, they have years and years and years of experience. I remember there is one student who literally has been in cybersecurity since almost the time I was born. So trust me. So it's also a lot of reasons for me. But then I found like if I comment, then it takes the direction there. Then the other thing I found is there are all the folks who also are established in the class, or you find if a come if a conversation is going in one direction, then it just keeps going. Then it doesn't provide this diverse perspective that everybody has. So that's why I loved it. You only see the question, you put what you think, and then you read what others think. So I guess I'm saying I don't have the full list of the like the discussion item isn't on my list in in Canvas. I may not have full access yet. Uh if you go on Canvas, you should see discussion what I'm sharing right now for other yeah. module two. Other than that, you should not see any other discussion because I am yet to upload them. I don't I don't you do not see module two. Fortune and Lauren, uh is it Lauren that was talking earlier? Fortune, can you yes, guys put? To... Okay, please fortune, connect with Fortune. Mind. Just a second, so sorry. Uh, please connect with Fortune to see how it can be resolved, or probably if it's a Canvas or Marimond related stuff. But I am, I think a lot of people, some have started commenting, so it should definitely be out there. Connect for uh, set some time with Fortune, and if it's still all resolved, just let me know and we will fix it. Does that we'll work? Do, thank you. Sure, thing, absolutely. Uh, any questions, anybody? Hey, look at that. I'm about to give you two minutes back after taking how many minutes? How many minutes did I take? I don't even know. Two hours, 45 minutes or so. Anyway. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we'll meet next week. Fortune, thanks a lot for continued help and everything. Thank you, everybody, and good night. See you next week. Bye-bye.